días, hermanos. Good morning, brothers and sisters. God bless you all. We're extremely excited to say hello to you, to share this time with you, and to enjoy this moment, which is the most wonderful moment in life. Isn't this right? Of course. What, what other beautiful moment can there be in life than us congregating? Why? Because it is the opportunity we have to give and give thanks to God. Because everyone who is here, we're all grateful to our God, glory to our Lord. And also those of you who are coming, attending the church for the first time, I think you all are feeling very, very happy to be here to, uh, to join us. And also the excitement and hope the, that our sister Mary Luisa in a few minutes, the pastor, prophetess, teacher of ours, apostle of the Lord, will teach us and we all will be greatly blessed. And also at the end of the service, you will be able to receive prophecy. The, the gift of prophecy will be ministered to you, which is the great, wonderful blessing God has given us in this time, and this, as in all time, because God always spoke to human beings. If you read in antiquity in the Bible, God always spoke to the people of Israel in antiquity. And he also promised that in this day and age, he would speak to human beings and he will speak to you shortly in a few minutes. So it is something wonderful, unique, irrepeatable. And it is the greatest blessing we can receive in life to be able to be standing before a God who speaks to us, who communicates with us, a God who has brought us here because he loves us. And he truly loves us because every day he blesses us and every day he protects us and helps us. We've all lived it. Isn't this, isn't this right? Isn't that correct? The Lord be to God. All right. So then let us dedicate to the Lord this time with all our gladness, with all our joy, with all our devotion. We're not going to think about our problems. We're not going to think about anything else. We're just going to focus and we're going, going to give our lives to God. Agreed. Glory to God. Let us pray to the Most High and let us dedicate to Him this service. Blessed Heavenly Father, we give you thanks with all our heart for this wonderful blessing, Lord, of allowing us to be here before you, all of us congregating from different nationalities, all of us as one man, standing before the Creator, before the only true God, before the God of the Bible, before the God who speaks to human beings before our Lord who guides us through the Holy Spirit in prophecy, the gift of prophecy, through visions, through dreams, through revelations that are wonderful and glorious manifestations in which we are directly led by the living God, by a, by a God who is in spirit and truth, a God who manifests himself to our lives, a God who has been by our side since the very first moment he brought us to his path and since forever, always protecting us and delivering us from evil and proving to us that he has watched over us always for our blessing, for our happiness, for true happiness, for joy and for our for eternal salvation. Glory to the Lord. We don't have how the means to repay you for the Abundant mercy, manifestation, glory, power, and wonders, deeds that you do in our lives. For you have also transformed us. For you have given us a new life. For you, Lord, have filled us with optimism and joy. And we know, Lord, that we have you by our side. That we can trust in you. That we try, We pray to you and you listen to us. You give us victory in everything. You defend us. You support us. You, you give us your support, Lord. And that is the greatest blessing as well to know that we have you. Thank you, Lord, for the church. In over 58 countries, Lord, thank you for our sister Maria Luisa. You, Lord, through our sister Teach us every day. You deliver us and you bless us and you manifest yourself and you work miracles, Lord, and you edify us and you give us victory. Thank you, O oh God, for this gathering. Receive, O oh Lord, the songs we're going to sing to your name. Every time we sing to you, we are praising you. Every time we sing to you, Lord, we are blessing you. We are thanking you for only in our hearts and in our mouths 
There are there are, is a song of thanksgiving. We praise you and worship you with all our heart. We bless you and exalt you. We honor you and glorify you. We give you praise. Oh Lord, receive this gathering. We present it to you with all our heart, and we long for the desire for the manifestation of your Holy Spirit to descend and let there be great manifestation. Let there be great glory of your presence, of your power, of your greatness. Praise as to the Lord, may it be so in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Glory to God. Let us read in the book of Jeremiah, brothers and sisters, chapter number 33. Let us read verse number 6. Jeremiah 33, verse 6. The promises that the Lord made to the ancient people of Israel concerning his manifestation, concerning his glory, but they were promises meant for his church today. And that's what we are living today. Jeremiah uttered them, Jeremiah stated them back then, but all those promises were meant for his people, for his church, for the gospel. Today, all of us who are here, we've all lived it and we've been we've proven this because it talks about peace and joy and cheerfulness. And this is what we've all lived every day. Glory to the Lord. Who among you has felt peace of the Lord? Glory to God. Who among you has felt gladness and joy? The blessings of the Most High? Glory to the Lord. And here they are, written by Jeremiah the prophet. Uh, starting with verse 6, we read for the glory and honor of the Lord. Behold... I will bring it health and healing. I will heal them and reveal to them the abundance of what? And truth. Glory to the Lord. And also healing and health because God has worked great miracles in the midst of the church. Verse 7. And I will cause the captives of Judah and the captives of Israel to return and will rebuild those places as at the first. I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. And I will, a, a new life, great transformation. And I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned and by which they have transgressed against me. Then it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise and an honor. That is what we do here always. Every time we gather, we come here as it states here, to be joyful with the Lord, to feel the joy of the Lord. Also to what? To do what? To praise Him, praise Him, and to honor Him, to give glory to the Lord, and to be give Him honor, to enjoy the glory of God in our midst, and His manifestation. Verse number 9, after the comma, among all the cities of the earth, who have, will have heard in this place of which you say, and they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and all the prosperity that I provide for it. Glory to God. It is wonderful. It is the promise of the Lord. Verse 10. Thus says the Lord. Again, there shall be heard in this place, of which you say it is desolate without man and without beast, in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem, that are desolate without man and without inhabitant and without beast. The blessing is forthcoming, verse 11, for the spiritual Jerusalem, which is the church of the Lord. The voice of joy, of what? Joy and the voice of what? Glad that is what is in our hearts. Joy and gladness. The voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. The voice of those who will say, what do they say? Praise the Lord of hosts. That's what we all say. Glory to God. For the Lord is what? We all say this? Of course we do. Glory to God. For the Lord is good. And he has been too good to us. For his mercy endures. Is it true? Absolutely. Our Lord always gives us a chance. Glory to God. The voice of those who bring sacrifice of what? Where are those who bring a sacrifice? To him, those who are grateful to the Lord, those who will bring uh, the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, which is the congregation of the Lord, which is our heart for our God. For I 
will cause the captives of the land to turn as at the first the remnant of the ancient people of Israel in his church today, says the Lord. Glory to the name of the Lord. You may take your sheets, brothers and sisters, and let us sing to the Most High with that gladness, with that profound feeling of gratitude, of admiration, of praise, of love, of veneration, of rejoice that we have in our hearts. How great is our Lord! How beautiful is our God! Blessed and praised is His name! Who among you says glory to God? Let us all say this louder. Glory to the Lord. Glory to God. And let us sing hymn 193. Oh, worship the King. Number 193. you gives glory to this beautiful God we have, to the wonderful and immatchable God we have, the beautiful God who speaks to us, blessed is the name of the Lord, the living God who is in spirit and truth, who leads and guides our lives, glory to the Lord. There is a beautiful testimony of a person who congregated in the church of Las Ferias in Bogota, Colombia, so he used to attend with his brother. To, uh, he used to attend the church in Las Ferias, Colombia, and he, his, his brother had a paralysis in his lower extremities, had a problem in his hips, and he couldn't walk. So they always attended the church, and they were very dedicated to the Lord. They always were seeking God and were pleading to God so that God would give a way out, out of his, out, his brother out of this problem to be healed from this hip problem, hip condition he had. He was scheduled to have surgery, but this surgery started to be rescheduled and rescheduled. And so the the whole time also they were wondering why is it that they keep postponing the surgery and a year went by and they they didn't schedule the surgery yet again. And so the Holy Spirit told him to be patient and the, that he was going to glorify and that the Lord was going to bless them and that the Lord was going to perform a beautiful work. What was their surprise? that on the day of surgery before he went before his this young man went to the OR he was supposed to undergo a very complex hip surgery he said allow me to go to the restroom very really quick so they allowed him to go, get off the table and when he got off uh, he moved as if as if he was a, an athlete 
And the doctors were surprised with how, with the ease with, with which he moved. And they said, no, th there's something wrong. Because a person who has a, such a condition in his hip and he's a, supposed to go to the OR shouldn't be moving that way. So they stopped and said, we just have to do uh, an MRI or a, a test uh, or an X-ray to see what's going on. And when they, they did the procedure, they found that this young man had a new hip, a glory to the Lord. These are the works of God. This is an extraordinary miracle. Glory to the name of the Lord. That's as such. He had a new hip. And doctors are were astounded. But this is the powerful and mighty God before we are standing. Therefore, if you have problems, don't worry. Because here we have a God who is sufficient in power, who has enough power, and he cannot be compared to no other, for he is the Almighty God, glory to the Lord. N none other than the Creator of heavens and earth, none other than the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Church of the Lord, our God. Blessed is his name. And for us to know more about that God, we also invite you to continue watching our website the church of the the church's website we have many testimonies with which you will also see the works of god and your faith will grow very much and you will be edified you will be nourished spiritually nourished and you'll be able to share those testimonies as well with your family members so that they may pay it they pay attention and know the living god who speaks who pro makes promises and fulfills them glory to the lord and this you can find it on the church's website, as you can see here uh, on the screen. I'm sure they're going to show it. That is the uh, web, the address, the website of the church, which is www.idmji.org slash English for everything English related. You will find all the Bible studies that have been given by our sister Maria Luisa. You will find the beautiful teachings of the doctrine because there are many people who don't understand the Old Testament because it is very complex, nor do they understand the new one, nor can they understand the symbology in it, nor do they understand the interpretation of the biblical texts. God has bestowed our sister, uh, upon our sister Mary Luisa the ability and intelligence to clear up those mysterious and wonderful teachings. So they are treasures that are precious and we they cannot be quantified. Unique as though we found a treasure, hidden treasure, uh, a hidden treasure. But this is a deep hidden treasure that we, that God places within our rich glory to the Lord. A precious peril, a precious treasure for all of us to enjoy it, for all of us to be able to cherish it and treasure it. And so the sermons as well, for example, as Sister Mary Louisa is going to preach shortly, these sermons, they reach our soul for they are the doctrine and a profound sermons. And in those sermons, we also find the same thing as in the Bible studies, a prayer led by our Sister Mary Louisa. Look at what happened a week ago. We had a general prophecy from our sister Mary Louisa. It was a very beautiful prophecy. We all remember, agreed? It was a prophecy that shocked us all because it was a prophecy that was truly beautiful. And we feel very joyful whenever our sister Mary Louisa gives us general prophecies. God starts to speak to the whole church through prophecy. And God made, performed a beautiful work in a person in Colombia who had been a victim of witchcraft and sorcery. And with that sorcery, they took his voice away. This person was never able to speak. And his son used to attend the church and he used to tell, tell her, Mom, come with me to church. Mom, I want you to go with me to the church. Because at church, that's where God can solve this problem for us because she would go to the doctors, but they didn't find any treatment. They her voice didn't come out, and she suffered very much. And she would try to speak, but she but no voice came out. And so she accepted her son's invitation. She came, and the Holy Spirit made a promise that He was going to heal her. But it was last Sunday when our sister Maria Luisa was teaching us, and she was praying for us all 
that's when she, at the end of the service, she asked asked for the microphone at, the, at, the, at her local church and said, the Lord just he delivered me and gave me my voice back. Glory to the name of the Lord. These are wonderful miracles. These are the miracles that happen in the church of the Lord. And you all should pay close attention as well to the sermons. Be focused. Think about nothing else. Pay total attention to her sermons and also total ser attention to her her prayer when Sister Mary Louise is praying for everyone because at that moment, even if it's afterwards in the video as well, God will work miracles in your lives. And same thing, so that on a, on a daily basis, we may nourish our spiritual life because our spiritual life is like a life of an athlete every day. We need food to survive. Human beings need food, need to eat, to live. Spiritually, we also need spiritual food to live. And that spiritual food we get it basically every day with the messages we receive on our phones, with the sermons that are short, the, the video clips from, from our sister Maria Luisa that we find on the on the church's website, and you can you will be able to find this in Maria Luisa Piraquive Oficial. You will be able to find it there. You will be able to see it. Your notifications. And you will be able to see videos seven minutes, eight minutes. But with those ten minutes. You will be able to get all your spiritual nourishment for your whole day. And you're going to feel well all day long. You will be able to maybe set aside 10 minutes after your lunchtime, before your lunchtime, or in the morning before you head off to work. 10 minutes a day, it's nothing. And with those 10 minutes, you will have food and you will be filled spiritually and we'll be happy all day long and not all night long and every moment in life glory to the lord let us take advantage of all these blessings let us take advantage of time and let us cherish the blessings god gives us for we have everything glory to the name of the lord god has given us everything for us to be happy and for us to be blessed how great is our lord let us rise and we are going to sing two choruses to finish let us sing chorus number 110 O oh Lord, you are my God. Who among you says this? Glory to God. time the most wonderful time has come let us welcome our sister maria luisa our spiritual mother our helper and protector let us welcome her with all our soul and with a big round of applause glory to the name of the lord <coughs> Thank you. 
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all my brothers and sisters in this day, all full of joy, happiness, gladness, because we have a meeting here with God. Every day, every day, we come and encounter the Lord. But just insane that we have a meeting on Sunday with all of you, it's it's to speak about God and to read the Bible and to reread and continue reading and that we never get tired in reading. And we always read the same things and God is pleased in that. The Bible is the book that never ends. It is a book that has no ending in its, in its scripture, but you start and you continue. You read until you die. And so God always tells us, read the Bible, read it. There are people who say, well, I've already read it. I read it three times from beginning to end, that's it. Others, oh, I already read it four times beginning to end, that is enough. It is not enough. The Holy Spirit always tells us to read the Bible. For every time we read it, we find something new, something different. And aside from that, it is the nourishment to our soul, our being, to read the Bible and to reflect upon the Lord's word. And more than that, and knowing, and at least having experienced, that God lives, God exists. God brings these words to life, this book. God brings it to life. For there are many books. There are many Bibles, perhaps, and many books that talk about God and that they say are from God. But for God to manifest himself and to bring to life what is written, it's only this, the Bible. The one that we all enjoy of this privilege. So this is why we are so happy, and this is why we will never grow tired in reading the Bible. And so that is the invitation for you all. And welcome to all those uh, first-time guests, those who are visiting us, people who maybe have been gathering for some time, some newcomers, welcome, all of you. And you may be seated, you can get comfortable in your places, and with a prepared heart to learn or to reflect on what we're going to read today, because in this manner, we are spiritually nourished and we honor our God. And we're going to continue with our scripture in Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. We'll start reading from verse 1 to 21, where the chapter ends. It reads, Finally, my brethren, the Apostle Paul says, now let's remember, we have been following this scripture of the epistles, the letters of the Apostle Paul sent to all of the churches in that time. And we have been continuing chapter by chapter, analyzing and reflecting and filling ourselves with the riches, spiritual riches of this wonderful doctrine. And here the Apostle continues to talk to the church here in Philippi. And he says, finally, my brethren, Rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe or a blessing. It's a blessing. The fact that he writes the same things, for this makes them secure in God. And he warns them in verse number two and says, Beware of dogs, or be careful, be on high alert of dogs. Who are the dogs? Now, it says, it mentions three types of people. It says, beware of dogs, so be very, be very careful with them. Beware of evil workers, so be very careful with them. And beware of the mutilation. Who are they? And so we are going to go over who those dogs are. Well, we remember, we 
Remember that our Lord Jesus Christ, when he was present on earth as a man there in Jerusalem, in Judea, he preached his gospel, the good tidings of salvation, and he was persecuted. Persecuted by his own people, his own community, and also by the Gentiles. The Gentiles were all those people who, or nations who did not belong to the people of Israel. As they did not belong to the people of Israel, they were called strangers, foreigners, any other nation, Syria, Egypt, any other nation, they were considered strangers and Gentiles. And in that time, when our Lord Jesus Christ was preaching, and the world at the time was ruled by the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire was, well, they were people who were considered strangers who did not belong to the people of Israel. And the Roman Empire was who ruled there, and our Lord Jesus Christ had to submit himself to their regimen, to that government. And so this is why they criticized him, why he hadn't paid taxes. And the Lord said, well, yes, you should pay the taxes. And he then sends the apostles and he tells them, go and fish. And in one of those fish are the coins that you need to pay the taxes. And the Lord, he would preach his word to his people, those in Judea and Jerusalem, to all his brothers and sisters of his lineage. And he would preach to them, but there were enemies present. And when they accused the Lord, they accused him before the Roman government. This is why the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, were present to apprehend the Lord. They apprehended him. And it says that they placed a crown of thorns and a cross for him to carry on his shoulder. And he was stricken, whipped, they insulted him. They did a lot of things to the Lord. They wanted to take his life immediately. They wanted to stone him as well. So he always had the persecution of the Gentiles or the strangers as they were the ones who ruled, the Lord couldn't do anything and no one could defend him, humanly speaking. Now, those people are those who were called the dogs. Those people. They are people who were not a part of the people of Israel. They were people on the outside. Strangers who had no knowledge of God, had no experiences with God. They had their own beliefs. They belonged to other religions, other idolatry, uh, re idolatrous religions. And this is why the Lord called them dogs. And there's a psalm, I believe it's Psalm 22, so that you can take some time out and read it. Psalm 22. In Psalm 22, it is our Lord Jesus Christ speaking of the time of his uh, crucifixion. He's speaking of everything that happened to him on that day. And there he speaks of the dogs. And the Lord says, free me. Do not forsake me. Why have you forsaken me? Free me because dogs have surrounded me. They have surrounded me, my feet. And then this is when he had the nails nailed into his feet and ha his hands. He said, these dogs have surrounded me. Those dogs were those Roman soldiers those who were part of the Roman government, they did not belong to the people of Israel. Then the same Jews, the Israelites, they did not personally kill the Lord. They delivered him over to the Gentiles, to those strangers, to do whatever they wanted to do with the Lord. Now they were called the dogs. So if you are intelligent today, today I'm sure they're dogs as well, meaning people, men or women, men and women, who behave in this way and could come against us to try and hurt us, harm us. And today in our prayers, we could say, Lord, protect us, protect me from the dogs, from those dogs who bark, 
who are angry and can bite me and betray me, protect me from that very well. So, in that time, the Apostle Paul, in the time in which he preached, there was a lot of danger. And they were sought after to kill them, to stone them, to imprison them, to take their life. That was the persecution they faced. So this is why the apostle is saying to those brethren in Philippi, he tells the believers, beware of dogs. Be very careful of them. Be cautious. You have to pray. You need to pray and protect yourself so that they or that you do not become victims of these people before due time. Now, of course, no one dies before due time. But the apostle would say to them, be careful, beware. Pray to God, ask him. So now we've understand this matter of the dogs. Now we move on to beware of evil workers. Well, that's easy to understand. Evil workers are people within the same congregation. People who come to the congregation, and there's a lot of people that come. There's hundreds of people, thousands of people who come and enter the congregation. And some stay for a long time. Others a short time. But... Among those people, there are some who are not sincere, who do not convert to God. But they only come because they think what is being done is nice. They think the singing is nice or the reading of the scriptures, or they think it's beautiful to hear prophecy. So they are happy. But with time, since they have not been sincere, they let themselves be dragged away by the demon or the devil. He is the one who excuses them and pushes them to go against the true believers of the Lord, the true followers of the Lord. Now, those are those evil workers. So they were present for some time. They worked, they served, they served in the congregation. They did a lot of things that needed to be done, spiritually speaking, and also physically. And then later on, you could tell that they were lying. They were hypocrites. They had not truly converted. And so they then show their hypocrisy, their lies, and their deceit, and their sin. Those are those evil workers, and they come to the congregation to try and bring people out to convince them and say, oh, don't believe in that. Don't listen to that. Don't pay attention to what this preacher is teaching you. Come on, come with me. Let's go start another congregation. And you see, God has spoken to me. He's shown me I'm going to start a different church. That in that church, that this one that we're going to start is going to be the true, true church. And I'm going there and I have a group of people who are with me. And we gather together in the apartment or in, in, in the room, whatever you want to call it. In a, a place that is special that we have prepared. We're going to gather because God has given me so much revelation. There is that evil worker speaking. And now that evil worker, I'm not just speaking or referring to a person here on the pulpit. No, an evil worker is a person who could be seated and says that they have laying on of hands and they have the gift of prophecy and they're laying on hands because they have spiritual gifts, they have dreams and visions and because they are consistent, that too is an evil worker. So those evil workers. And there are many people that presented in that time passing themselves off to be true believers, and they would steal the faith of others. They would cause those who were really seeking the Lord wholeheartedly, they would cause them to leave the congregation and lose all of their blessings. And they ended up with nothing because they were not seeking the Lord nor congregating or doing anything else. They would destroy the spiritual lives of families and of people. That happened in that time. Today, it also happens. It's the same. Today, there are evil workers. And I tell you, it's not just those who maybe stand on a pulpit. No, those workers, it's not just a person who's on the pulpit. From the moment you believe and you say, I am joining myself to be a part of the church of God. Well, I feel that God is here and he says, I'm going to lay on hands. I will have the spiritual gifts and I will testify. And maybe you start to invite someone or talk to someone about God. Well, now you become a worker of God just so that you can see and know what this, this term of a worker means. So you're now a person who is working in the things of God. You are doing something and God is observing your work. Are you sincere 
The things that you do in your work, are you sincere? Are you responsible? Are you doing it wholeheartedly? Are you doing it out of hypocrisy or deceit? Are you doing it out of money or greed or envy or whatever? So those here are the evil workers. So beware of evil workers. And then it says, beware of the mutilation. Now, this is in reference to mutilation of the body. Now, who are those who mutilate the body? Well, now many brothers and sisters know. They know this already. And it's in reference to the circumcision. It is in reference. Now, in that time, let's talk about that time. So in that time, the Jews, they would perform the circumcision because it had been a command of the law of, of Moses when God gave the laws to Moses. He told Moses, and the commandment even comes from Abraham, who was the first one to be circumcised. And God said, this is the sign that I am giving you to know that you belong to me and that I will form a nation. I will make everyone who are in my nation to be circumcised and those who are not will not belong to my people. That was the sign. That was the command God gave in that time. And in that time, there was a physical circumcision. It was a small surgery on the male member. Now, what happened? Well, later, God revealed to Moses that that circumcision that God had commanded physically, it was that small surgery on the male member, that circumcision had symbolism for the future, which symbolized a spiritual circumcision for the future. In the future, God would be raising up his true people who were holy and perfect. And that all would need to be circumcised and the Lord himself would be the one to circumcise them. And the circumcision was in the heart and it was in the spiritual sense. It was symbolic. And so he would say all needed to be circumcised, but in the heart, it was in the heart. Because everyone thought it was easy and simple to have that physical small surgery, but to have that circumcision in the heart, that's the hard part. Because that is when people, they think it's very difficult to do God's will. And if you allow me, I would like to read this when God gave the revelation to Moses here in Deuteronomy 10, 16, where we see how God reveals to him, he reveals to Moses that this circumcision that God had command, commanded, that small physical surgery in the male member, that in the future, it was a spiritual circumcision in the heart and no longer physical. So let's read here first, and then we will analyze it in Philippians. In Deuteronomy 10, 16. Now, starting in verse 12, I'll read quickly here in Deuteronomy 10. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Now, this is Moses speaking to the people of Israel in that time. Now, Moses was now uh, saying his goodbyes and his farewells because he knew he was going to die soon. So he says, now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them. And who were the fathers? It was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it says, the Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples, as it is this day. Then he says to them, therefore circumcise, verse 16, therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. So what do you think of that? Here, the Lord reveals to Moses that the circumcision in the future was no longer physical. 
It was now spiritual, the circumcision of the heart. And now we're going to take a look at what the circumcision of the heart means. It was symbolic. God reveals it to Moses himself. And let's take a look at Jeremiah 4, 4. Let's go quickly over to Jeremiah 4, 4. The prophet Jeremiah used by God being a great prophet of God. God also would send the messages to the people and to the king. These messages for them to be aware and were informed of the true doctrine, the true word of God, and what God wanted them to do in order to be blessed. Here in 4.4 it says, Now, we'll start in verse 3. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and do not sow among thorns. So he was saying, open your heart. Listen to the word. Listen to the doctrine. So that you are not sowing among thorns, that the seed that is sown should not be lost. It is better for you to then open up in fertile ground, meaning it's, it's a sincere heart who loves God and then receives the word, receives the doctrine of the Lord, and then it will grow and it will be of great blessing. But if your heart is full of thorns and the word comes to be sown, then it will be lost. So the word of God will not surge in your life and in your heart. Now in verse four, what does he say? Verse four, and I would like for all the brothers and sisters who are present here to read. Let's read verse four circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. And so circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts. What was this? What was in the hearts of those people? Remove or take away the foreskins of your hearts. Well, in that small surgery, there is something that is cut. The foreskin is cut. It is thrown away. And so spiritually, symbolically, God was speaking of the hardness of the heart, the disbelief and the disobedience of the people of men and women who, after seeing the wonders of the Lord, the manifestation of God, the calling of God, they were hard of heart, stubborn, foolish, and continued in their sin as usual, sinning and sinning all of the time. That, that was the foreskin that was on their hearts. And this is what the Lord referred to in saying, circumcise your heart. Remove this. Take away the hardness and the rebelliousness. Take away your foolishness and pride. Remove it. Take it away. Stop sinning. Stop being disobedient. Sin no more. Circumcise yourself. And as God spoke of that future, that wonderful future, that wonderful future is the preaching of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That wonderful future was in reference to the coming of the Lord, of the Messiah to the earth, to preach and teach and to give that new method of salvation that was so wonderful. So people needed to continue to circumcise themselves. And so the followers of the Lord, all the believers, all of us, we have had to circumcise our heart. We have circumcised ourselves. The circumcision is no longer physical. It's not that small surgery on the male member. Now the circumcision is in the heart. And as in the gospel of the Lord, the Lord accepted men and women, any race, any tongue. He doesn't look at that. What he cares about is a heart. He doesn't care if it's masculine or feminine, if it's a man or a woman, or what color they are, or what language they speak. No, he looks at a sincere heart that loves God. And that follows God and seeks him. That is what God observes. And so this heart is circumcised with the help of God. For it says that the Lord, he would be the one circumcising our hearts. We hear the word of the Lord. We hear his gospel. 
and we hear and we believe. And in the moment that we believed, the Lord began to circumcise our hearts and to remove what was evil, those tendencies that were sinful, and to remove all spiritual bonds and chains. And so he's made us free, and our heart was then left circumcised. Glory to the Lord. Now, what does it mean that we have no need then to sin? Why should we then sin? I am now circumcised. And now, now knowing the importance of the circumcision and that it is spiritual, in that time in Philippians, or the Apostle Paul, he gave a brief explanation concerning this true circumcision. Let's read here for a moment in Romans 2.29. Romans 2.29, a few books before Philippians. Romans 2.29, those who are not able to find it, just go ahead and pay attention to the scripture that we'll read. Here in Romans 2.29, concerning the circumcision, the Apostle Paul says, But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, so it's in the circumcision, is so it's not the circumcision that is done on the male member of a man, it says, but it said once again, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. That true circumcision is the one in the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter. The letter meaning the law of Moses when it said that they should be circumcised. It says the circumcision is that of the heart. It is to convert to God, not to sin. That is the true circumcision. That is a true Jew. He who does not sin and who loves God, who glorifies God, who has experiences with God. God speaks to them, blesses them. They are a holy, perfect man. That is a true Jew. That is the true circumcision or the true believer in Jesus Christ. Blessed is the Lord. And so the circumcision is not in the flesh. It is in the spirit. It is not in the letter whose praise is not from men, but from God. So, now as the Apostle Paul, or God had revealed to the Apostle Paul that truly this circumcision was not physical, this is why the brothers and sisters in Philippi, he tells them in verse 2. So let's go back to Philippians chapter 3. So this is why in verse 2 he says, Beware of dogs, of evil workers, and of the mutilation, those who in that time... There was a lot of people, a group of believers who had converted to Christ. They were uh, Jews, and they had come to the church, to the congregation. They had converted, but they were telling people, if you are not circumcised, well, then you are nothing before God. You are sinning. You're failing him. You are against the law, and you must be circumcised. And so they were twisting the spiritual lives of all of the believers. They were distorting their minds because they were ordering and demanding that they be physically circumcised for them to have the surgery. So this is why the Apostle Paul tells them, beware, beware of them. Do not take heed, do not obey them, those who are, the, who are mutilating the body. So he says, beware of the mutilation. And he was so angry and upset, he called them mutilators, because mutilating the body is cutting it here and there. If someone has their finger removed or, or something cut on their skin, that's a mutilator. So that's why he would call them that. And the Apostle Paul was right in calling them this because the Lord had already revealed that to Moses himself. Glory to the Lord. Now let's continue. Now we're done with that topic. And now what does the Apostle Paul say here? Now in verse 3, he says, For we are the circumcision, meaning we, the believers in Christ, Jesus. We are the circumcision, the true circumcision, because you're circumcised in your heart. You're no longer sinning. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoiced in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, which is the law of Moses. The law of Moses says you must be circumcised, have the surgery, but no, in the gospel, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit says... No longer is it something physical. It's no longer a circumcision that's physical. Now it's spiritual to stop being rebellious in heart of heart with God. Verse 4. 
though I also might have confidence in the flesh. So the apostle Paul is saying, well, I also might have confidence in the law of Moses. I'm going to change the word flesh for the law of Moses, for that is what it means here. If though I also might have confidence in the law of Moses, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the law of Moses, I more so. So he was saying, I have to trust in it more. Why? Because he says, circumcised on the eighth day. He was circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel. That he is of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the law, he was a Pharisee. So this is why he says, I, I have confidence in the law of Moses. I have fulfilled all the requirements. No one can tell me I didn't. And now, after all of those things, after having circumcised himself on the eighth day of his birth and to be a part of the tribe of Benjamin, and he came he, from the lineage of Hebrews. So he says, and he was a Pharisee. Now he says, now who am I now? Verse 6, concerning zeal, he was very zealous of his religion. He said, I was so very zealous of the law of Moses. Verse 6, persecuting the church. He persecuted all the believers in Jesus Christ. He persecuted the apostles and all those who had converted. All of those people I persecuted, he would say. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he was blameless. No one had any complaints about him that they saw that he had some bad conduct. He always said, I was always someone who kept the law. I was strict in all things. He was strict in everything. He was blameless. No one could correct him or admonish him for anything because he kept it to perfection. That is what he said. And after fulfilling all of those requirements to the max, now what was the Apostle Paul? He was now a follower of the church, a follower of the congregation of the Lord, a follower of a true gospel, a follower of the wonderful work of the Holy Spirit, a follower of that law of the Spirit of God, the gospel of Christ, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, working and acting in the midst of thousands, millions of hearts of men and women who want to seek God and who from that moment that our Lord Jesus Christ preached and taught and left his church established, he left the foundations of it. The church has been in the hands of God and God has been watching over his congregation all of the time. Blessed is the name of the Lord. And so now the Apostle Paul is saying, what should I desire then? What should I be criticized for if everything that I was, I did to perfection, and now there is something more important in my life. It is something that is perfect because I am a follower of this true gospel where I am irreproachable, blameless, and I am zealous of the things of God because God has opened my eyes and made me understand his doctrine. And above all, the experiences with the Holy Spirit and the spiritual gifts, which is everything that he shares and narrates. And so all of this he was preaching and teaching. And today, after so many centuries that have passed, today we say the same. It is the truth. The Apostle Paul was never mistaken. He was never mistaken in his teaching and in his dissertation because truly, he was clarifying that which God taught him. And today we live, we feel, we experience it. We have seen it. We have seen God's wonders. We have seen the miracles God has worked and the manifestation of God in our lives. How he has protected many people's lives. How he has freed people from being kidnapped. And others who maybe are threat, have received threats and God, how God has protected them from those dangers whenever they're going to be shot at. Maybe the pistol doesn't work because God doesn't allow it. God is protecting people's lives, those who follow him, his children, his believers of this true gospel 
This gospel, which is ruled by the Spirit of God, blessed is the Lord. And so today, we also speak and we say very proudly that God is in our midst and he rules over us. He lives. He is real. He exists. He is the same God. And so he is a wonder in our lives. And so it says here, the apostle Paul says in verse number seven, after he shares his situation, he says, but what things were gained to me? So everything that was gained to him, he says, I have counted loss for Christ. So he said, everything I've lived, everything I was, now I say it was for nothing. It was a loss now because now I am living life better. I'm living a new life, a different life in Jesus Christ. Yet, verse 8, yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain in Christ glory to God. So what do you think of that? He considers everything else rubbish, everything he experienced, that he was a Jew and circumcised of the tribe of Benjamin, that he was a Hebrew and that he was a Jew and a Pharisee. He says all of that now is nothing that everything now is considered rubbish because now in Jesus Christ, things are better, a new life in Christ. For that is the way that truly leads you to God, leads you to eternal life, leads you to rejoice with God after death. Blessed is the Lord. In verse nine, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, so he says that he was found in Christ, not having his own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So it says that he now lived by the law of Jesus Christ, by the law of the gospel, the law of the Holy Spirit. Verse number 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. So he was happy, happy having known this wonderful gospel where God is there close to us and near the hearts of us all. Circumcised now, of course, our hearts because we are with God. We walk with him. Verse 11, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. So he was saying in that moment, in the midst of his modesty, he would say, well, I consider that I have not attained or reached that perfection, but I am continuing on. I'm continuing on and I will arrive and reach that goal, he says in verse 12. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. So he was called by the Lord and joined by him. The Lord found him. The Lord took him and brought him on. And so we too, we walk by the Lord's hand. And those who believe, and those who believe that they're still not walking by the hand of the Lord, make an effort to walk by the hand of the Lord. Blessed is the name of our God. Verse 14, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if you, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, He lives in our hearts. The Lord is who circumcises the heart. But the person needs to prepare themselves for God, love God so that God may circumcise them and then God will make them a perfect man, a holy man and a man that will reach that goal and that will attain eternal salvation. This is why the Lord would say, be faithful, be faithful until death for I will give you that crown of life. Blessed is the Lord. We all have these promises and we are all fighting just as the Apostle Paul fought for this, we too are fighting to reach that place. Verse 18, 
For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. So he would weep and he would cry and suffered for defending this cause of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we too, we too suffer as well. Those who love the Lord, we suffer for the Lord's cause. And we defend it and we want to always defend it with what we can, however we can defend it. And to continue forward. And so the apostle, Paul says in verse 19, so he says, So the end of those people who are enemies of the Lord is destruction, whose God is their belly, meaning the material things in life, the physical things that they only worry about that. And they reject the spiritual life, and this is why they persecute those who follow the Lord. And it says, and whose glory is in their shame, meaning they only think of those things here on earth, those enemies of the Lord who set their mind on earthly things. Verse 20, For our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Here the apostle is saying, now he was maybe belittling what he said in verse 5 and saying, well, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the stock of Israel. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews and a Pharisee. But he says, well, all of that, He considered a loss. It was rubbish to him. And now, for him, there was a new citizenship. He says, for our citizenship is in heaven. Verse 20. From which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So this citizenship is heavenly. And this is the one that we too, we are fighting for. Blessed is the Lord. And so all of us and all of the people who perhaps are newcomers, people who are our first-time guests, I invite you. I invite you to read the Bible. And do not get tired in reading the Bible. And do not read it like a literal or a, a book of literature or a poetic book or a book of philosophy or a tale or a story and any ordinary narration. No, read it in the spiritual sense, as if God were by your side, and that you're reading this, and that God is saying, well, you're understanding? Do you see how I behave? Do you see what I do with people? Do you see what people do with me? Do you see what they receive? They receive blessings, or they receive a punishment. Do you see that? All of that, read it, as if God was by your side. And in that way, your reading will be very profitable, spiritually and materially as well. Now in verse 21, to conclude, and it says, Our Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, meaning this body that has been humiliated in life by the enemy and by all of the things and the struggles that you face until the time of your death there has been a lot of suffering perhaps and problems nevertheless it says that the lord will transform that lowly body he will transform it that it may be conformed to his glorious body so the lord will transform all of our bodies He will transform them and turn them like the body of the Lord. Because the Lord was majestic, glorious. And that is how we will be. This is the wonderful promise that we will be like that one day. Our bodies will be transformed from glory to glory, glory to the Lord. So it says, I'll reread verse 21, who Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself because the Lord is mighty and powerful to do it. He subdues all things, all powers, and all those great things that exist that are supernatural and powerful and strong, and we as humans... We are powerless. We are weak before that. 
But our God, he makes us strong and courageous. And we are able to, and we fight, and we are able to achieve it. And we will reach that goal. We will reach that goal, and that goal is the day of our death. And so, like our Lord Jesus, when he was on the cross of Calvary, it said that he would say, it is finished. What was finished? What did he finish? He fulfilled all of the law of Moses. He fulfilled it all in order to abolish it, in order to make it null, and in order to achieve the wonderful plan of salvation that God brought even before the foundation of the world. And he had to fulfill the entire law because he could not change that covenant if that old covenant had not been first abolished and removed. And he fulfilled it all in order to annul it. And when he did that on the cross, he says, it is finished. It is done. That's what he told the father. That's it. And people heard it and no one understood it. What does it mean? It is finished. Well, the law is done. It's finished. Meaning people will no longer be slaves of all of the requirements and the commandments and precepts of the law of, Mo of Moses. No one would be a slave to that any longer. They, will, they were now free. For they now will live their life in Jesus Christ. A spiritual life. And God helps each man, each woman to live a holy, upright life. And God transforms them. And God helps remove that sinning tendency. The only thing God demands and expects is that people to prepare their hearts and love him and say, Yes, Lord, I want this. I want this. Cleanse me. I want to be transformed. I want to go to eternal life. That's it. Let us pray to our Father and give thanks to our King, O blessed Lord. Holy Father, Heavenly Father, Eternal God. Father, you spoke to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you spoke to Moses, and you walked with Moses, and you taught him the word. You taught him the doctrine. And you taught him the commandments. And he understood them. He understood everything that you taught him on Mount Sinai. And Father, and you wanted this. You wanted all those who continually would come after Moses for all of them to be men, to be before you, fulfilling your word to its totality and to teach the people to live a holy, perfect life. And you wanted to have a holy nation without equal, singular to you, and different from any other nation of the world. But that was not the case, Father. But your word and your wonderful plan continued in some hearts that loved you. And your plan continued, my Father. And it continued for many centuries, even to this day. When you, Lord, in your mercy, you sent you sent, Lord. You came, you yourself. You came to earth. You made yourself a human being. You made yourself flesh. And you lived in the shape of that man, Jesus of Nazareth. And you manifested yourself. And no one knew you. No one realized it. They did not know who they were dealing with, Lord. But that, that is your will. That was your plan. That is how you are, Lord. Sometimes we, we walk with you by our side and we don't even realize it. Sometimes you speak to us and we don't even realize it, Lord. Our flesh has a type of veil that separates us from you. Nevertheless, your mercy and your love are so great and your promises are so wonderful. And this is why... We are here in your presence because you have helped us and you have allowed us to be able to feel your presence and you have allowed us to have a cleansed and free heart and for you to enter it, to make your dwelling place in our being and for us to enjoy 
enjoy your promises in the way that you speak to us, in the way that you teach us, that wonderful way of speaking to us through visions and dreams and prophecy by revelation. That way, we have had that privilege despite all of this. You have had that mercy with us and you have helped us even to this day. And Lord, help us and continue to help us always because we need you, Lord. We need you every second of our life. And so, Lord, I know, Holy Father, that many changes will come, positive changes for the future, for the church, and for the spiritual lives of many. I know, Lord, I know that you will be raising up many people, many prophets and apostles, evangelists, pastors, teachers. You will be raising them up for your church because you have so said it, my Father, and I know that you will fulfill it because your promises are faithful and true. This is why, Lord, this is why my heart is joyful before you for these wonderful promises because you will not forsake your congregation, your church, and all of the promises that you have made us over 50 years now, Lord. They still stand even this day and will continue to stand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Father for hearing us, for watching over us, for listening to our prayers. And now I ask my Father, now I ask my Father that you be looking over all the people, the thousands of people today. They all have their own needs. They all have petitions and desires in their heart. And some of them are suffering bitterly and others are weeping. Others who are ill, others who have loved ones who are ill and they cry out of that illness and the children, children that are also ill, children who have autism, children who have Down syndrome, children who are even in wheelchairs and who have paralysis, who are not able to speak. They have a certain age now, they still cannot speak. All of this you know, Lord. They are evil spirits that have come to their lives and to possess their bodies. Deliver them, Lord, and rebuke all of those spirits rebuke all of those diseases and remove the witchcraft and sorcery deliver and hear hear the prayers and all of the pleas of all of the men and women who cry out to you and ask you for mercy lord you are our god and there is nothing impossible for you you are a love thank you my father Thank you. In the glorious name of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, help us, Lord, to believe and to love you with all of our heart and with all of our soul. We praise you, Lord. We give you the honor and the glory. Thanks, my Lord. Blessed is the Lord. Yo sé que estás aquí, Señor. Yo sé que estás aquí. Yo sé que estás aquí, Señor. Yo sé que estás aquí. Mi alma te alaba. Mi alma te alaba. Mi alma te alaba. Porque sé que estás aquí. Mi alma te alaba. Mi alma te alaba. Mi alma te alaba. Porque sé que estás aquí. Yo sé que estás aquí, Señor. Yo sé que estás aquí. Yo sé que estás aquí, Señor. Yo sé que estás aquí, mi alma te alaba, mi alma te alaba, mi alma te alaba, porque sé que estás aquí, mi alma te alaba, mi alma te alaba. Mi alma te alaba, porque sé que estás aquí. Glory to our God. Thank you very much, my dear brothers and sisters, to all the people who are visiting us for the first time. I love you all with all my heart as well. And kisses to all the children and hugs to you all. God bless you. And until next time.